I say that, and then I also want to immediately unsay that, because four of them were transgender people. How do you categorize them? I put them in a category based on what they were at the time that I interviewed them. So 20 people who presented as men and 20 people who presented as women. Um, the women have a much easier experience than the men. It's much easier to be a lesbian out there than it is to be a gay man. The lesbians are, if you're a woman in the male, you're sort of presumed to be a lesbian. And that makes it easier. Plus, you know, how do lesbians identify ourselves? Often by looking, acting, behaving in a kind of masculine way. So that makes fitting into the culture easy. Lesbians will frequently joke about sex in a way that makes fitting into the male environment easier. None of that works in the same way for a gay man. So the 20 gay men that I interviewed experienced really high degrees of brutality, harassment, violence, attacks. <laughs> One of them just called me from the hospital again with four fused vertebrae in his neck from being hit in the head so hard that he got the flesh. So the kind of ongoing physical attacks are it's not that they don't happen to women, they do, but the intensity of them is directed more at men than at women. So I'm going to read you some of the stories of the men. Understanding the culture of the males, the sense of being beleaguered, unappreciated, and under threat from vague external forces is crucial to understanding how masculinity works in the males. Fifty years ago, if you were a steel worker, you got a lot of respect in our culture. Now that is much <coughs> less true partly because of the shift in what it means to be middle class, how you get to be middle class, our sort of perceived national sense that now everybody should go to college. That wasn't true 50 years ago. There was a much more stable, respected, blue collar culture that there isn't now. And that's one of the things that makes being a steel worker, now if you're a male steel worker, you have to kind of fight for respect in a way that it used to be given to you because of what you did before. And that fighting, the need to defend what you do and how you do it, is one of the things that makes male steel workers so hostile towards gay people. Sense self-presentation tends to be reactive. It exists in a context motivated by change or opposition. The exaggerated exclusive performance of masculinity in the males may be a response to threats real or imagined, from African Americans, women, foreign investors, job loss, and gay men. As Mary Margaret Funno notes, since Big Steel was linked to masculinity and to the United States' rise to world prominence, the collapse of the steel industry became a metaphor not only for decline and decay, but for the loss of manhood. So the United States used to have so much pride in industry, the things we made, the things we did, so much has eroded that in the last 50 years. And it's eroded not only the sense of America as a world dominant power, but what it means to be a man here, and how that gets represented and identified and how it kind of works. When this collapse occurs, who gets blamed? And who pays the price? And how does masculinity reconstitute itself? So one of the things that happens is if you're a male living in this world, you need to do things to kind of reestablish your right to be respected, your sort of the ability to get up in the morning and go to work. That have to be stories you tell yourself to make that possible. The males and what happens within them have not changed much over the last hundred years. Both the current process and its culture emerged early in the 20th century. As Carol Olson reports in Steel Wives, male labor created harsh, unhealthy, often dangerous conditions, contributing to a masculine environment of both camaraderie and competitiveness. Dave, one of my narrators, described his work in the blast furnace by saying, to me, it's like working on a volcano. He explains the process of continuous casting and the working conditions it creates. He says, you could not, under no circumstances, get up to that level. So it's always an emergency. You've got to get these tap holes opened up. So 
so you try to stop the molten iron, and many times we missed. Can you imagine a thing of, a thing of iron, maybe 10 feet long, and maybe 150 feet across, and the wind is just pushing it towards you? Dave is here trying to convey a sense of the scale, the danger, and the stress of his job day to day. And it's hard to explain this to an outsider. His desire to share these experiences is thwarted by their alien nature, by his incomplete knowledge of the big picture, and by a lack of vocabulary comprehensible to the uninitiated. He's trying to describe to me what happens at work, and I just kind of can't get it. The scale of the mills is really hard to envision. Lots of the people told me that they work in trucks every day whose tires are taller than they are. So everything is in this huge scale. The mills are like miles, square miles, and everything is on a just enormous scale. And that, almost just the physicality of that, is really one of the things they try to give me a sense of how that feels and works. Isabel, who has worked on a mill janitorial crew doing mundane tasks not directly related to the production of steel, describes her father a longtime mill worker whose persona reinforces the masculine creed of the mills. She says, steel workers got to be big, they got to be tough, they got to be strong. The work they do is not for what you would consider a sissy or anything like that. My dad is a vet, a manly guy. He likes his football. He's polite, he's a gentleman, but he can blow a fuse right off the bat due to years of being undermined by his work. How they were treated up at the steel mills, too. They're always thinking about who's the toughest one. We've got to pick the toughest ones. The picture you see of the steel mills, you think of some big, tough, strong, burly guy. And it'd be really weird if someone took off their welding mask and it was a girl. They'd be like, oh, that's not right. It's so embedded in your mind that it has to be a guy, and it has to be strong, and it has to be straight. Isabel gives voice to the connection between her father's being undermined at work, his anger, and women's exclusion. If being a steel worker no longer guarantees masculinity since layoffs, givebacks, corporate takeovers, and negative media attention all collude to make even those steel workers with jobs feel insecure and defensive, then steel worker masculinity must be reinforced through the exclusion of women and of gay men. Yet, this exclusion is a challenge. Since masculinity is often reinforced through sexual language or behavior between men, which often resembles the behavior of their words to exclude. So, what makes someone feel like a man? One of the things that makes that work is comparison to women, right? How many women are out there? And the women that are out there are really masculine. So, so first let me answer the question, how many women are out there? In 1976, there was a court decision called the Consent Decree where they decided that they had to allow a certain percent of women and minorities into the mills. So following 1976, the percent of both of those increased a lot. At a high point of 1982, U.S. Steel, which was the most integrated mill, had 12% women. <coughs> That was the high point. We all know that the federal government no longer enforces these sorts of things. And so now the women present at all the mills combined is one. There are hardly any women out there. And there are hardly any minorities. And the reason for that is really tragic because in 76, when they hired women and minorities, they put all the African American people, or almost all of them, on the hot side. The males have two, generally two components, the cold side and the hot side. The hot side is where the steel gets melted and created. The cold side is where it's rolled, treated, processed for the market. The hot side is the dangerous side. I mean, it's all dangerous, but the hot side is the most dangerous. It's where the fire is, the billets come out and get squished. And all the minorities were put there because the jobs are less desirable. And so almost all the minorities that were hired in the 70s have died. So I couldn't interview them. And that, you know, the, the way that the cancer and danger of the male combined with racial hiring policies 
made that be that now almost everyone in the bill is white and almost everyone who ever worked there who isn't, isn't surviving anymore. So there are some, but there aren't a lot. And how people get hired in the mill now is when they need to hire, they give you a form and say to you, tell people in your family or people you know to submit their application. It's not like a general call. So therefore, they get to mostly hire people who seem like the mill worker type. They mostly just hire white men. And you know, they do it because the federal government doesn't enforce hiring the way it used to. And because they're calling on kind of the assumed stereotypes of the people who are there. So, I mean, I could add that everybody, everybody I interviewed offered to get me a job. Like, they are hiring out there, and if you have content, you can get in. I don't really want to work in the mill, but they, they do exist, and they will kind of reach out and try to get you a position in them. Um, so what is it like to be somebody who works out there? I've said that there's a lot of harassment and violence. What form does that take? So somebody like Bernard was hired in 1979 into U.S. Steel Dairy Works. And he's worked I mean, he's worked at the mill since then, but because of the kind of pattern of layoffs, this means that he has a patchwork of working, getting laid off, being rehired as a laborer, and working his way back up again. So he hasn't been at the mill every day or anything, but he's worked there since 1979. And he has been endlessly harassed, so beaten up, attacked, teased, taken out of certain work crews and put on others, shifted around, never felt like really comfortable with where he is. And like many of the steel workers, he saw an explosion. He saw an explosion in a basic oxygen furnace. So at one point he was working there and heard an explosion and went toward it to see what was happening and saw limbs unattached flying toward him and when the explosion happened again, which often happens, he fell down a flight of stairs and hurt his back and was out for a while with that injury. But when I interviewed him, he was at work and then, well, he was working at the time, not exactly when I interviewed him, but he called me a few days later saying that his doctor had yellow carded him. And that means that your doctor calls in and verifies that you're unable to work right then for health reasons. So his blood pressure was really, really high and not responding to medication, so he couldn't be out doing his dangerous work under the circumstances, so they had yellow card to him. But he said when he called that this was just as good because the death threats he was getting at work were at a really high intensity right then. Maybe if he could leave for a few weeks and it would die down and he could go back. And he's been living with that kind of fear, daily harassment, physical attacks since 1979. And seeing violence and danger happen to other people and feeling like he's not safe to make allies with anyone that he works with and feeling just sort of under that kind of endless stress since then. So, and he's one of the people that I interviewed that was kind of heartbreaking because he thought I could do something. Some of the people that I interviewed who were in particularly bad circumstances thought that if they talked to me, I could make it better somehow. And, you know, I'm a researcher. I mean, I did call the union and I told them and they said, oh, he's a troublemaker. We're not going to help him. The union in general has not acknowledged the needs or issues or tried to protect the people that I interviewed. Unions are under so much attack right now, right? So what they basically try to do is get the highest wages and the best benefits for the largest group of people that they can. This means that minorities and gay people don't get any attention or any kind of support. So if you file something with your steward or your griever, they're likely to let it fade away rather than devote a lot of time or attention to it. Did you have a question? Yeah, it's, this just kind of points out 
public, even though you personally couldn't do anything just to another person on an individual basis, mm -hmm. it points out how the gay movement, for one thing, there's so much more work to be done. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, the gay movement moves along and you're part of that, just by, by virtue of the fact that you've written the book you, and, and that you're standing up here and talking to people. You're helping that person because you're moving society and our culture along towards acceptance. So in that, what that does is highlight one of the things that kept happening to me when I wrote this book, which is it's so easy for people living in cities and you know middle class people or people with some degree of privilege to think that it's getting easier to be gay, right? Yeah. You know, marriage was passed in Illinois. Most of us feel pretty safe and protected in our homes work, you know. We can walk around, everything's fine. That's not true for the sewer workers at all. It's measurably worse than it was 30 years ago. And partly that's because in the, the, the people that I interviewed said that in the 70s or 80s, well, not as much the 80s, but at least in the 70s, which they refer to as the disco days, it was okay to be gay at work. People were like, oh, that's just him, he's just weird, but it didn't bother them. They could just accept it as their coworker, they'd go to gay bars, they'd go to street bars. It was fine, it was just considered, you know, he's weird, but it's okay. He's one of us and we'll overlook it. But as the gay movement came to political prominence, and started to fight political battles and get a lot of media and other attention, then it wasn't just that weird guy in the corner. It became a threat to a way of life of sort of traditional mainstream America. So now what happens in the middle is if you in any way get associated with gay people, you're gonna be way more targeted than you were 30 years ago. And that's something that it's really hard for me to make a lot of audiences see or understand. Because, and partly like, gay people have fought so hard for what we've gained, right? <coughs> Over the last 30 years, there's been huge amounts of media, political work that went into making this possible. So you don't want to look at people who are at like a high point and say, wait a minute, there are people who are not benefiting, in fact, being hurt by the progress that you've fought for. So the steel workers in general hate people like us, right? Because we're the ones who get them targeted. So they routinely say things like, I would never go to the pride parade because those kind of people are those sort of, they refer to you know pride parade participants as queens who walk around naked and act like they're like revolutionaries when they don't have any idea what price other people are paying for that visibility. So there's a way that, I mean, we all know that there's diversity in the gay community, right? But there's also a way that the sort of ideal image of who's gay is like white straight architects who live in Boys Town, right? And there isn't a sense that there's all kinds of people stretched all across the population, many of whom we would recognize or identify with. But to the extent that gay people are moving forward, we have to be sure that we bring them all, or we haven't really made anything. So in the, the unions aren't making that easy. But to say, so now what's happened is, for the first five years that I was working on this book, I tried to reach out to the unions, I tried to contact them, I tried to say, here's what's happening, what can you do? And they always said to me, we would. We have our hearts in the right place, but there aren't there are no gay steel workers, so we don't have to. But now that the book exists, they can't say that. So they've agreed to talk about it, think about it, but they still say, in order for us to protect people, they have to stand up and identify themselves. And so then I say, yeah, that's not going to happen. You have to make it safe for them to do that and tell them that if they do, you'll protect them and prove that, not just say that. And then you might have somebody come forward, but until then, nothing is gonna happen. 
So then there has to be a way for the union to make that safe space with nobody in it and then let people move into it once the safe space exists. So talking to the union about how to try to make that happen. But there is also a way that the existence of the book makes people feel visible that had never felt visible before. Or like, you know, important or identified or something. So, you know, most people were like, why would you want to talk to me? Nobody cares about me or who I am or what I am. So a way of saying, yeah, they do. People do care. You just have to say what it is. And, and then people will hear you when they do care. They just, it's hard if you're that silent. And even though I interviewed 40 people, how many other people did I talk to who wouldn't sign the form? I mean, <laughs> there were just lots of people that I would meet in bars or friends of friends or whatever who'd be like, I'm glad you're doing it, but I'm not going to sign that thing. I don't want to take that risk. So there are, or I'm not going to take that risk or I'm too busy or I don't really have anything to say. Like the most common response I got when I said to people, what's it like to be gay in the steel mills? The most common response I got was, I'm not gay at work. I wouldn't do that. That's too risky. So I have nothing to tell you. And you know, as a researcher, I would try to say, okay, but that is something to tell me. You know, sign the forms 